But since we can both talk while uh, you're not unmuted yet, Ken, I don't think. Uh, can you guys see that screen? We see the screen, yes. Okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna wrap kind of like rapid fire through those, and you tell me which ones trigger that you want to hear more on. And these were uh, at first I would say that Dr. and I were suffering flashbacks because this looks very close to the uh, uh, to the hedge fund strategy about 23 years ago that's still running and is still robust and uh and this his debrief sounded like every conversation we've had about this the things we were suffering with and excited about so the first one was the idea of the uh, percent exposed per position uh, i would say but it, it feels like 10 plus or minus five so chunks of five or ten percent of capital at risk that's your that's your bet Think of that as the each of these is a chip stack and you get started and then the signals come and you start putting the chip on and that thing runs by itself until it's out. Um, the, the maximum number of open positions becomes an issue when you get clustering with correlated ETFs that all of a sudden they come at once. So you ne you'll need a rule that says if I'm going from partial exposure towards full exposure how fast do I start easing the capital in? Not too soon because it could be a dead cat bounce and I get hurt. Not too slow because then I've missed that nice grinding bull quiet that I want to, so I want the Cinderella strategy to, to properly, perfectly add my money in and out uh, as the market improves. Um, so what does the cash do? Uh, safety is always a good thing. There's almost no other good idea for cash that's not already where your cash ought to be and leave it alone. If your cash is being treated well, then you're okay. So uh, I wouldn't worry. About, I wouldn't let what to do with cash uh, try to complexify the system. Have a separate system for what to do with cash, and then and then don't uh, don't try to combine that with this one. Just move it into a different region, which then leads you into a, a larger strategy question that now that you're satisfied that you have something that's good, you've got to decide what purpose this is having as part of your total overall strategy. Is this the growth engine that's going to give you the fat right tail with an acceptable risk with a high rate of loss? No, not really. Is this the quiet growth component that is holding my uh, retirement money? Uh, yes. So you want to be very clear about what the purpose of that thing is so it will help guide you with your risk management decisions when the risk comes. You want to make sure that its identity is very strong and that its role inside your larger strategy is, is well established. Um, when you're looking at the ETFs for backtesting, you've got to be uh, clear on how diversified you want it to be. I always think you should be more diversified in your backtesting strategy in order to surprise yourself that, hey, maybe there are pieces of this thing that are working when the rest of the market is bad that I didn't even think of, like utilities you'll find, uh, are really well suited for this kind of uh, uh, bullish quiet when the rest of the market is tanking. Utilities are rarely a growth element, but there are certain times uh, when the U.S. market's in bear that something like utilities uh, uh, turns out to be pretty savvy. So when you have a backtesting strategy that looks at a wide range, you're really doing a little kind of like data mining, but strategy mapping, and that will allow you to uh, not be limited by your assumptions. Um, be, the other way to go wrong on that, by the way, would be to s pick 100 ETFs to test that all have a 0.9 correlation to the S&P, so you think you're getting diversity and you're really not. And th the, the reason that's important is that the correlation of volatility um, and, and returns in the broad markets looks like this. Uh, when the S&P is in a bullish mode, you get 
a wider range of correlation. You get uncorrelation with asset classes. That money's trying to find the thing that's really working well, and it investigates many places, and so you get a wide spread in correlation. When the market begins to tank and starts tipping towards fear, suddenly all those correlations disappear, and everything converges towards one. Uh, and so what you think is diversification really isn't at the very crucial moment when you need diversification. So when you're picking your, uh, your out-of-sample test, you want to make sure that you have a wide variety of S&P market conditions so that you can see how the correlations or the diversification you think you have really holds up at critical times. Uh, your your protection against that is the is the the fail safe exit. Uh, you pick twenty percent. Uh, I think that's a good wide uh, stop to start with, but it also correlates with the conservative traditional definition of a bear at twenty percent. So what you really have is you're attempting to model institutional long term buy and hold with a twenty percent catastrophic protection stop. And the reason that that works long, long, long term is because it works. Uh, it may not be ideal if you're 65 years old next week and you're trying to protect that retirement income and let it grow and you're willing to take a 20% drawdown. No, you're not. Not really. Whatever you think your drawdown percentage that you could tolerate is, I would say start with dividing that by five and see what that does to you as you trigger because as you trade forward it turns out that that is um, uh, losses at five and ten percent are already going to get your attention if you're a mammal if you're a mammal so uh, I would be concerned about that um, you have a uh, uh, something I want you to look at this is a really important one take a look at the chart where you showed over the back test period to the to the end of COVID and that nice beautiful long run that's one of the three greatest two-year moves ever seen and so I'm not persuaded that the frequency of bull quiet that appeared in that three-year run is historically reliable that's you always say that but here's what I want you to go look at that chart go take a look at the 50 period moving average and the slope there was a time when everything sucked and then things started to slowly get better and the price crossed the 50 period moving average at the same time the 50 period moving average was bottoming out and beginning to ha have a positive slope there was about a three month period until it crossed the 200 period moving average then I want you to notice the behavior of the slope of the 50 period moving average. That's a pretty good definition of a bull market in any, um, in any uh, ETF or any market. And so you can get an elaborate volatility based or SQN based, but let me suggest that your visual cortex will resonate with the slope of the 50 period moving average and that by the way is a fractal insight I don't care what time frame you're looking at if you look at the slope of the 50 period moving average you're gonna be happy that you did the positive slope of that 50 it takes about five or six weeks of improving price behavior after a bear to begin to be positive you're you're now able to start entering in the springtime of what's going to be a bull move. It's going to be a bull move someday. It has to be. Otherwise, Western civilization collapses. So there will be bull moves. So take a look at the slope of the 50 and then see what, see what a 20% protective stop or a 10% or a 5% looks like as a trailing stop below that, and you're going to be glad that you did on any time frame because by the way this strategy that you have is fractal to time frame it's independent of time you could put this on hourly charts and be pretty happy um, uh, next thing 
I, I want to talk about the decision, the trade-off decision between frequency of trading and a wide initial trailing stop. And, and then five minutes later, you said your your thought about using this would I would I would come home, check the signals, put the orders in, and let them run. So that suggests that this is a conditions based, and you're doing a daily check. So I would say if you've identified conditions that are favorable, and your exploitation of the system is positive, let the condition determine what the frequency is. If the cost of putting the order in is small and the anxiety that you feel for placing the chip on the bet is small, then then go examine the importance of the infrequent trading mantra. That's a legacy. That's an artifact from a long, long ago when the only way that you could be a long-term buy and holder was to accept infrequent trading and really long payoffs. If the cost of entry and getting the signals and managing the position is approaching zero, then I think you should re-examine the importance of that as a design criteria for uh, your system. I think it's connected to a desire not to overtrade and not to get signaled to death. Uh, your startup entry, you know, your entry conditions and filter conditions will keep you from overtrading. So I would, I would go back and revisit that one as a design criteria now that you have some evidence to see how the system is evolving. Take a look at your back test in that in that bucket of 95 or whatever, how many ETFs, and then see what ETFs were carrying the load. Uh, and then and see why and then see if that's something that you could exploit by studying its performance a little more closely so you find the front runners and then you you study their behaviors um, I would take a look at the duration of the bull quiet in the model that that you're running in, in the hundred percent of the time that the market is open how often is it actually in the conditions that you're trading and then take a look at the ones that you're not getting and are there observable moves. That's what's going to lead you to studying the uh, slope of the 50. That doesn't mean you have to add it to this system, but it gives you an idea for a follow-on uh, system that doesn't require bull quiet or allows you to have a slightly different approach to how to trade the spring. So then I'm going to give you two uh, indicators I'd like you to think about. Take a look at the moving average convergence divergence with the uh, 10 and 30 with a smoothing factor of 5. And you're going to see on that chart a really nice orderly progression from winter, spring, summer, and fall, which will give you some ideas about when to think about applying the uh, exit insurance that DR talked about, that when you're coming into a crossroads or known trouble points, that you may be able to activate uh, some insurance to keep you in longer positions for tax purposes, if that's what that's about. Uh, the second indicator I'm going to tell you to look at is the PSAR, the parabolic stop and reverse, with criteria 0.2, 0.12. When you put that on that chart, you're going to notice uh, how well that keeps you in long trends. And when the PSAR flips, it's quite often the first alert that you're entering troubled waters. So 0.2 and 0.12 on either daily or weekly charts, you're going to be happy that you did. Uh, it's uh, the one thing we've learned in the last three years of nightly nightly podcasts. I've given coaching sessions on over 5,000 daily and weekly trades in the last three years through COVID because we didn't have anything else to do. The number one rule that comes out of that is trust the PSAR 0.2 and 0.12. If your charting package allows you to put that on the 10 period regression line, you're, you'd be happy uh, to do so. Um, the seasonality of regions and assets. Uh, when DR and I looked at this one a while ago, one of the things that we considered was uh, what is the broad market condition as it influences the some of the smaller opportunities that you're getting? And what we discovered was that there are long periods of time in which everything's going up together. We love it. Uh, 
There are times in which there is a regional sector rotation where the market is generally bullish and quiet, but you get s sectors coming in and out of phase. And we sort of solve that one by saying, let's take 10 sectors of the world market and let it control 10% of the exposure and then use that as a way to regulate how much heat that we could add to it. That is still one of the best ideas in the last 20 years. And you're going to find that that aligns very nicely with the way that I th think your TFs that broadly move uh, and, and go through uh, long periods of stable growth. Uh, I think, uh, and what I'll do, DR, or, I mean, uh, uh, RJ, is send you guys the, the rule set that DR and I came up with that described that mechanism of managing money based on market and sector heat map just as sort of a, a guide. It, it's the very first thing that I look at on my daily and weekly report all the time anyway, no matter what, because that has been a nice way to regulate my feelings about how risky it is in the world. You could be more complex, but I don't know you can be more robust than something that's still working 25 years later and, and and kept us out of all of the collapses of the internet bubble, the real estate meltdown, the uh, long-term capital management breakdown, uh, and COVID, and, but got us back in in time. So that's pretty good. The four existential threats of the last 30 years, that little strategy uh, provided you... Uh, a way to sleep at night. Um, I, I guess the last thing I would say on this one is um, what to do with abnormal gains. So when you plot your maximum favorable excursions and you want to respect a gain that is average plus one SD. When it crosses that threshold, if you were ever going to add a rule about when to harvest an abnormally large uh, uh, crop, that's the one that you want to do. And DR and I approached that one back in the day. We had a 10% initial stop, but if it ever got past 15%, we knew that was abnormally large, and so we made it a 5% trailing stop just to put us on the side of the angels. So it's, it's uh, unusual for large big indexes to have runaway moves that are abnormally amazing, but you might. And so you want to know what that number is to decide if you need something to preserve an abnormal gain in the same way that your, your initial stop is protecting you against abnormal losses. You know, the 20% stop protects you against the four or five exp exposures to 50 percent losses of the last 20 years so so you're in good shape on protecting against the downside the upside is one where well, it's a good problem to have what do i do with abnormal gains the reason you want to have a strategy for that is because that's the source of your self-doubt and regret and if you, if you let a good one get away, that'll drive you nuts, more so than, you know, avoiding a big loss or whatever. It's the one that gets away that will just murder you. So you want to have a deliberate plan and a measurement of when do I get into abnormal gain territory and then how do I preserve. Now, I went a little longer than I, than I wanted to, but uh, some of those ideas there are going to uh, w will be similar to what I would say on the other one. So I just want to kind of set that as a baseline. Uh, so I would just say uh, bull quiet is the one you want. You just wish that. And then the only reason it doesn't last is because latecomers, everybody that's been trying to short that thing, finally gets religion, and then they jump on board the bull, and you get you get this spike of buying, and then everything becomes bullish, volatile, and raging, and then it gets a little jumpy. But bull, bull quiet is the one you want as long as you're protecting against the winter. And I think you guys are in good shape for that. You have a very sound strategy, and there's a couple interesting points of departure. And it was clear to me from your back testing and the system development itself that it, you learn something about system design by designing a system. And 
there are things that you can only learn by doing it that way. And so that's why I would say on the second loop around this, spend time on looking at the lessons learned and the other in, the other points of departure and not so much just trying to hurry up and fix the system or improve the system. Think about some of the longer term developmental insights that you got because those are going to pay off on every future system that you design. So I would spend some time with the, the general purpose lessons learned and, and not just the specific answer to a particular solution because you'll end up using those other tools uh, a lot in the future. But I thought really good work and uh, it's a comfort to know that uh, that thing is still working because uh, I got a lot of money tied up in that. So uh, uh, it's always good to be reinforced. So that's everything I wanted to say there. And uh, I'll